Hey guys, what's happening? So check this out. So I picked this up two days ago. Kind of been playing with it. It's a Kitty X Smart 3. So it's one of their newer uh, like Clipper all-in-one um, printers here, but pretty cool features about it. Um, yeah, I, it's sort of like in a competition with uh, like the Carbon X one from Bamboo Labs, or that the whole Carbon series because this thing actually has carbon fiber rods on it. Yeah, I think the newer versions might not have the carbon fiber rods, at least the bigger ones. But uh, yeah, you can see carbon fiber rods. So it's very Bamboo Labs ish. Their whole new series of printers. Um, but it, this video is more about like the technical details of this printer, not so much of this like the just basically the printing capabilities, but more of like a deep dive into the actual hardware, like the LCD which runs it, the actual more like the hardware components. Um, yeah, I mean it's just a basic you know Core XY printer, you know, but it's actually decent build quality. I'm kind of impressed. Like it did this eventually pretty good. Like, that's pretty damn good. I mean, this is PLA Plus, but that's, I mean, the thing with factory printers is they usually have them dialed in pretty good because they only make so many printers, so they just specialize in these few printers. So they just, you know, they do a gazillion different test prints to get the whole, the configuration dialed in. Like the jerk settings, mesh, input shaper, pressure advance. Um, but the cool thing is since it's run Clipper, you can kind of, you can see what they did in their configuration. Um, it's a it's a proprietary board. Um, I'm gonna flip the printer over and I'll show it to you. But yeah, it's it's a proprietary LCD too. It's not like your typical like um, like Raspberry Pi LCD. And I'll, I'll show you that. All right, so it's running a 24 volt, 350 uh, watt power supply. But to get the bottom case off, just take these screws off here. Here's a closer look at this. So it's very Bamboo Labs ish with uh, dual uh, Z screws and one motor. It's not the exact, the exact same routing pattern, but it's very the, the same same concept as the Bamboo Labs. Um, but actually, this came out around the same time, so I think this printer is probably a couple years old, maybe a year. But this is uh, actually mainly what I was interested in here. So hopefully, maybe I can get some better light on this thing. Um, all right, so here is the main board. So it's basically uh, an SBC or single board computer and an MCU or three D printer board. And like a Raspberry Pi all on one board. Um, so this is actually it's this is actually made by MKS, but it's not a skipper. Not a lot of loud trucks come by. I live on the corner. Um, so yeah, like I said, this is an actually it, it's made by MKS, but it's not a skipper. So it's a pretty cool looking board. Um, it only actually has three drivers. It has three twenty two and nines, and I confirmed that in the configuration, the Clipper configuration. So you have your X and your Y for the core XY, and then you have your Z motor. But the extruder actually runs off a, a, a tool head. Um, you know, the tool head actually has like an accelerometer. Your typical like, uh, you know, like your CAN bus tool board, like this right here. That's a Big Tree Tech EBB36, but same exact thing up there. But I'll go through that after, after this, and I'll show you the internals of the extruder system, how it operates. All right, so closer look. Yeah, one thing that kind of bugs me here is that is this asymmetrical mounting of the heatsink, and all the boards I've seen online are the exact same way. They do; I, they have to be doing this for a specific reason because, I mean, the chip is going this way; it's going parallel with the with the rest of this board. So, I'm guessing they do that to get better airflow from the 30 millimeter fan. Um, they probably should have. Um, Position this fan maybe in a different spot, or put a forty millimeter fan in here. Um, but yeah, that kind of drives me crazy—the asymmetrical mounting of the heatsink. Uh, another thing too, like Nero three D made a comment on one of his videos that they actually had the fan connected to a a, a voltage in a twenty four volt rail, so it's always on no matter what. And even even though I could actually move this to a different like a pulse width modulated control pin to control the fan they probably did this so you're cooling not just the drivers off because you don't really need to cool the drivers off so much but to cool the actual the, the CPU off of the SBC alright so it runs a rock chip A53 A50, or Cortex A53 um, 
I don't know for sure, but I'll, I'll fire it up. See if I can SSH, SSH into Linux. But it should be like one gig of DDR3. If it's anything like the skipper. And the actual the Linux-based operating system runs on this eMMC flash right here. So recovery could be a challenge. Um, it doesn't like your typical Raspberry Pi runs off a flash card here. But what I'm thinking is if you had to restore this thing, if you wanted to convert this to like a full version of Linux, um, I'm thinking how would you connect a monitor to it? At least with, with a skipper you have an HDMI, HDMI port. But you actually, they do actually make USB-C to like HDMI converters. But like I said, that's not the end of the world because what you can do is you can buy a, a, one of these MKS uh, EM, EMMC flash modules to a USB converter. So you could, if you had to reflash the Linux based OS, you could just pop this module out and hook it up to that USB converter and flash it that way. Um, so it's interesting when they have them both. You have it's, you basically have two different computers. You have two processors. You have your 32-bit ARM processor up here. Then you have your SPC computer down here. But it's all kind of intertwined between the traces. So it's kind of a trip. You know, you have your boot reset, you know, to flash this. But like I said, you can also flash this with an ST-Link. Um, and just looking at the configuration, it's communicating via UART. So... Um, you're not communicating obviously over USB because you don't have to. You're, it's on the same board. So the same way like an SK or Pico would communicate with the Raspberry Pi or any other board that has UARTs. So it's just communicating via UART. Uh, another interesting note is the LCD. I'll go to the top. I'll go to this after this up my gut there. But the LCD runs on this cable here. And the LCD, it's, all, it's 5 volt ground and you have a receive and transmit. <clears throat> um, but it's not like a typical like Raspberry Pi screen that you normally see. It seems like it operates more like a, a traditional, like old school, like one of those color uh, Marlin screens. I'll grab and I'll show you. So here's your old school, well, I guess it's not super old school, but this is a big tree tech, TFT35, I believe. But it operates as its own actual computer, sending G code back to the, the processor, to the main board. Yeah, via a uh, UART right here. Um, so yeah, it has its own 32-bit processor, and it basically functions as it has its own programming, and just functions it functions basically as like a Raspberry Pi or, or mini computer interfacing with the board. So I feel like this screen is functioning in the same way, because I'll go, but there's a processor on that screen too. Um, so it doesn't it do, doesn't seem like it functions like a typical Raspberry Pi type screen. Um, so another interesting notes too is are these supercapacitors? What are these things? Um, are these to in case to restore power in case the board goes offline, or is it to provide like an instant in case you for is it there to prevent voltage drop, and hard accelerations? Like you have driver capacitors here, small ones. Not sure. So it looks like the board is it's a twenty-four volt feed. The wires look nice here, nice braided looking wires. Uh, the voltage input, but then it looks like it's a twenty-four volt bed. So sometimes you'll see like on a higher end printer, you'll see like an AC heated bed, but this is just basically running off the twenty-four volt rail. Um, looks like the wireless it doesn't actually have integrated wireless on the main board. Looks like it is like a little wireless module here. And this little USB plug goes to the front here. All right, so I'm gonna get my stronger glasses on and I'm gonna see if I can figure out what these things do. All right, so I'm gonna go do a closer look at the ports here. Hopefully you can see that. So you have an RJ45 uh, ethernet. I mean, it'd be difficult to get a cable in there, but you could if you had to. Um, but I don't even know if the programming would be programmed to pick up on that, you know, in uh, Linux. But uh, so what I noticed is that even with the skipper, is when you see an M, see M dash USB. If you can see that M dash USB, that means MCU USB. 
And if you see an H, that means host. That means the Linux-based operating system in here. So you have a USB port here, host USB. Like I said, sometimes you can actually get a, like some devices actually are, can run HDMI over USB-C. So um, I don't know for sure because I don't see an HDMI port anywhere. Not that I'm aware of. All right, so closer look at the tool board going up to the up to the tool head, the hot end. Um, you have a CAN bus connector here, and then you have USB-C. So the can it's very similar to this right here. Like you can either control this thing um, as USB-C or CAN bus, and they chose to do USB. Um, I actually think USB is a little bit more reliable uh, than CAN bus. I've actually had some issues with CAN bus. I'm like, the wiring has to be perfect for CAN bus. Like you need to have it very shielded and very twisted. Um, yeah, you can get like a lot of crosstalk. It's really susceptible to interference. Okay, H, hot end. Okay, um, what else on here? So no, no USB port. I'm not USB, HDMI port. There's a lot of extra connectors. So since there's really no pinout diagram, you can, the only pinouts that you know are what's already defined in Clipper. Who knows? But here's a closer look at the flash. So the Linux-based OS is actually on here. And what I was saying is they have a USB adapter. So if you had to reflash Linux, you just remove this module and plug into a USB adapter in your computer and then re-image the file that way. Yeah, I don't see any sort of header for, I'm looking for a header for like a, like a video out. I don't see it, so. I don't know what, what that is. Is it labeled? Nope. All right, cool, so um, that's MCU. I mean, I guess maybe you, this would be good for like if you wanted to flash the MCU. If it, I don't know what, typically, uh, I mean, this would be a pickup like firmware.bin or something like that. It might be able to flash it that way, but you could flash it directly over UART. So you do that, you put it into bootloader mode. All right. All right, pretty cool. I mean, I'm pretty confident if I wanted to reinstall uh, Linux on this, I could do that or put like a, like a vanilla version of Clipper on here. And the main thing is probably would be this LCD. I mean, I think that'd be the biggest issue. Yeah, because you don't, I don't know, this, this is not interfacing, I don't think, with the MCU. Because I already looked in the Clipper configuration, and I don't see any way this thing would interface the screen with the MCU, so it's interfacing with Linux. Um, all right, cool, let's flip this over and we'll look at the tool head. All right, so, all right, so there's a little cable chain. I'm gonna take the whole extruder apart. I'm gonna clean it out just because I don't know what's in there. Like one of the things with these printers is that they get clogged. That's from what I was reading. They get like a lot of heat creep. So you probably wanna to, want to control retraction. Um, you know, with the with the with the carbon or the Bamboo Labs Carbon X1, the whole head pops off. You can just it's all magnetic, which is pretty cool. So it looks like it's running 48 millimeter stepper motors, NEMA 17s. So that should get this thing, I mean, it's a, usually typically a smaller printer prints better. Um, so this thing's just, it's probably gonna fly. I mean, it has two 48 millimeter motors. Um, and it's really light gantry. So yeah, this thing could possibly fly. I know I probably shouldn't, but I do actually have some Super Power HTs, LDOs, um, high current steppers. But I need to keep my hands off this printer. It's for my kid. <laughs> it's hard for me to not do it. <laughs> okay, yeah, every time that the light goes off. Like when it goes, that's cool because when it goes to sleep, the light will go off. All right, so 48 millimeter motors on the X and Y or just the Core X Y system. And yeah, it looks like a smaller on Z. Yeah, that um, one connector that goes to the board right there. So it looks like it's the same. You have the RX, TX, and then ground and five volt. So that's the one that feeds back to the main board. So whatever they're doing, they're doing it over uh, two wires. 
It looks like you might have an SD, a micro SD card from here. But, I don't know, is that an ARM processor right there? What exactly is that thing? Um, so that is actually an Atmel chip. Uh, if you can see that little processor right there, so that would be some sort of pro it wouldn't be like, a, like an ARM processor, but it would be like a... Before we had 32-bit ARM processors, we had the 8-bit uh, Atmel chips. Um, those have been going back for probably, I mean, I've been programming those for since the early 2000s with the satellite dishes. Um, okay, so let's... All right, so it looks like it's two, a couple two millimeter screws here to get the back off. All right, so here is the main tool board. So if you guys are new to 3D printing, this thing's basically like its own little computer up here. Like you have your own like stepper driver, so that would be your stepper driver in there. That runs the extruder motor. Um, this one probably most likely has an accelerometer on it, so you can do like input shaping. Um, there would be a CPU somewhere in here. It's a processor, probably on one of these pieces of plastic. But I feel like this thing's communicating via USB cable. It comes right in here, into the side of the, the PCB. Yeah, this controls basically the probe, all that stuff. So I mean, all the cool thing is, like I said, the pinouts are in, in Clipper already. So at least they give you access to the Clipper config, which is pretty cool. So that was just four screws. Um, I don't get the front off here. Alright, so yeah, it was just pull up, pull out. So take a look at the down below here. So you have a 5015 main part cooling fan. And then um, you have a, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a 30 millimeter uh, hot end fan here. So with a 30 millimeter fan, you got to be, this thing needs to be perfect. Or you get heat creep. I mean, like usually, typically the ducting needs to be perfect. Uh, because I'm actually designing a lot of extruders on 30 millimeter fans, and if the ducting and cooling is not perfect, you'll definitely get heat creep. Uh, uh, the carbon rods too. Looks like a kind of dirty. So I might have to take some rubbing alcohol. Yeah, you shouldn't lube these things up. Yeah, see, I don't. I don't know. Um, you shouldn't have to lube up these these things. Um, like I know with my Solari toss printer that I built, um, I use oil impregnated bronze with graphite inserts on them. Um, so I'm going to clean this up with rubbing alcohol. And then, um, yeah, but you don't want the oil or the leach into the carbon, you know, the resin, and deteriorate the resin. Um, all right, so it looks like it has a 36 millimeter NEMA 14 motor. But it's running the, I'll, I'll take the cover off here. Here's a clicker, I'll click on the motor here. Like a, it looks like a NEMA 14. Um, so it might seem weird to some people that I take this apart before I even start 3D printing it. Um, but I like to take apart things and see how they work um, because I don't like mysterious black boxes. I want to know how these things work. So in case I got to troubleshoot later on, I know exactly what's going on. It's not just some big mystery. All right, so I'm going to take this apart and then make sure there's no... Sometimes filament will get clogged in here, you know? Because, I mean, it's you're doing like this automated insert and retract, or it, you're doing like an automated load and unload. So sometimes, this is, where, this is typically where they lock up. Like you'll have a, especially with a short extruder like that, um, you'll get a piece of filament that will lock the filament in place inside here. So I know a lot of the early people that were actually had these things were getting a lot of jams. So, yeah, the hot end pulled out pretty good here. Pretty easy to pull out. I said it was just two of those M3 screws. Alright, here is the extruder. Uh, yeah, it runs the large gear like the LGX, the Bontex style gears. I've actually made and designed a couple of different extruders that are based on this, like the Bodomus Maximus and a couple other ones I haven't actually uploaded yet. All right, here is a picture where they use the extruder taken apart. Um, so yeah, these larger gears are actually a lot better than the original like BMG style gears. Um, so yeah, these are like a BM or a, a, a what's it called like a a Bontoc, Bontoc, and they were the ones that started that. Um, okay, so it looks like there's no way to adjust the uh, tension here. So the spring tension is automatic, no way to control that. Yeah, and actually I wouldn't typically, like I said, I wouldn't normally buy like a store-bought printer, but this thing really checks all the check marks and it doesn't have like cra crazy proprietary firmware. Like, uh, I can't stand the firmware on the uh, Bamboo Labs. Yeah, I was fixing them. I fixed uh, three of those now. And, um, yeah, this thing's, the firmware is horrible. 
like you have no control over it. This is cloud-based, it has to connect to the internet. It's almost like a security risk, having to, if your printer needs to connect to the internet to run and function, you know, that's like a security. I mean, you can't really have that in like a government building or anything sort of like, you know, if you're working with, um, yeah, that's a security risk. I mean, I'm an IT guy, right? I mean, having a printer that has to connect the internet to do stuff, I mean, that's a major security risk. All right, so I'm gonna put that back together and we'll fire this back up. And, you know, when I took this apart, there was only three screws in here, but it feels like I was missing a fourth screw here. So I'm gonna add that. I mean, I'm adding weight to the extruder, but I don't, it doesn't make sense that they would have a screw hole there and not have a screw there. So maybe the guy had taken it apart and forgot to put it back in there, or who knows. It's kind of a unicorn right there, but this is actually why I just converted to Clipper, but that's a Narakiti Tech X12. Like, I, you never see anything. These, these, um, you never see these printers anywhere. But the build quality was so high on this one, like it was, it's so sturdy and so smooth, buttery smooth, the access. I mean, that really kind of gave me a good confidence on Kitty Tech. You know, look at the bed of that thing. Six millimeter plate. I mean, but everything was designed very well. So, um, so far I'm pretty impressed with the hot end of this thing. Um, yeah, good job, Kitty Tech. I'm gonna rub down these things with some rubbing alcohol. Let's do a quick little 3D Benji here. I mean, I, I'm not really, I like doing the calibration to get this better actually, but this is already on the on the machine. All right, this thing is pretty sweet actually. This thing's definitely get Bamboo Labs and run for their money. Plus, I think they're getting sued too. So, um, the Benji. God, that's really smooth. Those rods, those carbon rods. I need to, I need to find a source of those carbon fiber rods, man. I mean, I could buy the whole gantry and use them for my other printer, but... Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, I've actually worked on hundreds of 3D printers, so... I've seen a lot of different motion systems. Yeah, I think I like this better than the K1 Speed, too. Yeah, not bad. I mean, this is a factory uh, model, so you think you have the settings out in pretty good. All right, so let me give you my final thoughts on this. So, I generally think the Bamboo Labs, the build quality is slightly better. Um, it feels like they use a little bit higher grade plastic, you know, it just feels a little bit more well built. Um, but the problem with Bamboo Labs is their, their firmware is so proprietary that it's just, I mean, it's horrible. I, I can't stand it. So I've actually fixed three different Bamboo Labs printers and they were kind of a nightmare. Um, you know, reflashing the different modules and firmware mismatches and different things like that. But yeah, I mean, overall, I, I think this is a really cool printer. And I think you, like I said, if you want to go vanilla, for, like once they stop supporting this printer, that's what I'm thinking. Um, because in, in a couple of years, they're going to stop supporting this. They're going to stop doing updates for it. Um, so I'm thinking like long term, you know, because the with a 3D printer, right, the mechanics don't change very much, you know, they stay kind of the same, but the software and the and the hardware, like the the main board electronics, change. Um, so overall, I mean, for the price, I'm really impressed with this thing. It, it prints great, you know, has all the little bells and whistles, and it's, you know, you can get one for. 279 on their website, 330 on Amazon. Um, but yeah, I like this more than the K1 Speed. So I've worked on a couple of K1 Speeds, the Creality K1 Speeds. Um, yeah, because they use the, the carbon fiber rods. So, all right, cool little printer. Now I just got to keep my hands off it. <laughs> it's for my kids. So I haven't, yeah, my goal is not to play with it. Just let it, let it be. <laughs> all right, guys, cool.